welcome the city council. Look over to the old city council. This is a special uh, session of the city council to receive training on the do's and don'ts for city council. Uh, I think it's important for us to have this type of course. It's going to be presented by Ann Bennett, who is the executive director of the Washington City's Insurance Authority. And I'm going to turn the, the explanation over after we have our roll call, and then we'll have Ann on it. Andy? I'm here. Bill? Lauren? Mylan? Here. Kevin? Here. Shannon? He's not here. And Julie? start the uh, City Council Do's and Don'ts training now. Um, I'll turn the uh, time and the uh, running of the meeting to Ann Bennett, Executive Director, Washington City's Insurance Authority. Ann, are you there? I'm here. Thank uh, you, Mr. So. Mayor, and thank you, members of Council, for having me. I must say I'm, I'm glad I didn't have to try and get across a closed pass. <laughs> uh, to attend the meeting in person. Uh, I, I, I'm, it, it's nice to sit at home and, and do this training. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and go through the PowerPoint. I don't know how many of you can see it um, when I do share it. Uh-oh, it says that you've disabled screen sharing as Connie. Oh, what do, what do I do? I uh, don't know. I, I think just enable uh, screen sharing. You might be able to set me as a host if you go into participants. That might work too. I think it's probably a security setting you have, but I think if you make me... Oh, there you go. Does it work? Okay. It worked. So okay. let's see if I can get this up and running and I'm going to share that screen. Can you guys see the screen? Now I got to try and, <laughs> there we go, get to the slides. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, I am Ann Bennett, the Executive Director of WCIA. And what I'm going to do through this training is I'll take pauses in between the slides. It's a little difficult uh, for me to see everybody while we do the training. So I'll take a pause in between for questions. But if you have one, uh, go ahead and shout it out uh, during the presentation as well. Uh, I find that these virtual, sometimes it's hard for me to know that you have a question. So just feel free to say I have a question if you do. So the first thing I want to do is kind of tell you who we are, um, Washington City's Insurance Authority is actually a municipal organization. We're formed by over 160 various municipalities and municipal entities who came together to self-insure their risks. Mainly that was because the insurance marketplace doesn't like cities. Um, they don't like insuring the public entity risk. And so we were created in 1981 so cities could self-insure their risk together and pool their resources. The city of Goldendale has been a member uh, since 1986. I've been with WCIA uh, 24 years now, and uh, back in my distant past, I was actually the risk management rep for the city of Goldendale. So I know your city pretty well, and I've worked with uh, Larry for almost all of those years. <laughs> we go way back. Um, WCIA has over 160 million in assets. Uh, so you are safe knowing that your money is with us and we have the strongest financials of any risk pool in the state. What we offer the city is basically self-insurance coverage. So 
Um, you get 20 million per occurrence. This one says 25. I must have not updated it from last year. And you get auto general employment practices and errors and emissions coverage. And the reason it stepped down from 25 to 20 is because uh, insurance companies have started pulling out of the public entity market. So we weren't actually able to get insurance um, for 5 million excess of 20 million. One of the things that we do is we look very hard to find coverage for our members rather than look for exclusions like most insurance carriers. We do also purchase coverage for the city. So you're fully covered for crime fidelity that covers all of your uh, bonding requirements as a public official. We also have cyber and pollution policy as well as uh, first party property and auto. Aside from that, um, one of the big tenets of risk pooling is that we provide risk management. The idea is that we want to prevent the loss from ever occurring. The majority of cities, I would say, um, not the really big cities, they self-insure, but probably about 80% of all cities belong to some type of risk pool. And it really is our mission to help you avoid um, having the claim in the first place and to make your city safer for your citizens. So that's why we come out and do these trainings. And this is a training that I do for councils so that you as an entity or as an individual don't create liability for the city. So that's what this training is about, to help you understand where you could create liability. So that's all about WCIA. Do I have any questions on, on WCIA? Hearing zero, we'll get into the, the good part, which is you as an individual have absolute immunity for your legislative activities. So when you are legislating as a body as a whole, so when you're adopting budgets, you're passing ordinances, you're adopting resolutions, when you are a body as a whole making these decisions, you cannot be sued individually. And People have tried. People have tried to sue individual council members kind of as uh, a, a technique of intimidation or coercion. The law is very, very strong. And in fact, in one case, uh, when we had somebody that was suing individual council members, uh, we went ahead and got sanctions against that party and they had to reimburse us all of our attorney's fees. So just know that when you are on the dais, you are legislating, you have an absolute immunity for your activities as a legislator. Any questions on that? So we're going to go into specific areas of liability that councils get involved in. So I kind of broke it up by different areas. And so we're going to start um, tonight with land use. This is the first topic we're going to talk about. So um, with land use, one of the uh, areas that councils get involved in is hearing appeals. And so sometimes you're sitting as a what's called a quasi-judicial board. And my guess is when you're going to be sitting as a quasi-judicial board, you will be told that by your city attorney or uh, by Larry. They will say you are going to be in a quasi-judicial hearing. And it's important that you know that. Um, when you sit quasi-judicially, that is different than sitting legislatively. So basically what you're doing is you're acting as a judge. And when you go to court, judges are fair and impartial. They don't have one side or the other in mind. They are simply there to find facts. And so they are the fact finder, which is what you would be. You must be fair and impartial. And there's something in land use law called the appearance of fairness doctrine. And what that says is you, from a reasonable person, looking from the outside in, you must appear to be fair and impartial. So uh, it's, it's not that you think you're fair and impartial. It's that a reasonable person who would look at you um, and, and how you're sitting as that decision maker as fair and impartial. So what that means is you can't communicate with a proponent of, let's say, a particular um, project or an opponent. 
And this is where it can be difficult because your citizens are coming to you on a lot of issues. And let's say you have a land use development that uh, you get a lot of community input in, this could be an issue because they are gonna say they're an opponent to the project and you cannot communicate with them. So I do see a raised hand from, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Kevin. Is it Fioc? That will work. Okay. So when we're talking about facts and records, does that include common knowledge such as law, no matter how obscure it is? And also, um, we all have different um, strengths and weaknesses. If our strength is, let's say, in my case, um, regulatory, are we allowed to put that forward? Because the common person, a reasonable person, is not going to know what we're thinking. Is that coming through? Yeah, I, I think what, what when you're sitting in this role, you have what's called a closed record hearing in front of you. So you only get to consider the record that's presented to you. So, you know, common knowledge is there. Um, you know, you're, you come with a common knowledge. If you have an absolute, um, let's say, you know, I, I am going to disclose that the developer is a friend of my husband's. And then I disclose that. And usually when you disclose, you know, there may be a bit of a conflict, I can say, but I can be fair and impartial. Um, you, you know, or you can recuse yourself. Um, when you come with these ideas or uh, preformed opinions, that might get you in a little bit of trouble because you can only use the facts in the record and then you have to make findings of fact based on that record. So that's where you have facts in front of you, maybe because you know something else, if that enters into your decision, um, that may be problematic. And, and so you have to go with what's in front of you on, in the record. So I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, you know, the record in front of you says, you know, it's X, Y, Z, and you say, but wait a minute, when I was out there, I saw um, this other thing going on. Um, you don't get to talk about what you saw out there. You have to look at the record in front of you. Are we allowed to add to the record? Uh, I don't believe so, because you're sitting as a judge. So... Um, and I say I don't believe so because I would punt to your city attorney on that one, but my understanding is you only get the record in front of you when you're sitting as the judge. So you get the record and you're listening to the appeal of the parties, but adding to the record seems like you'd be adding facts. I, I guess that I, when you say adding to the record, um, I would say you could add questions. You know, you could say, I have a question, can you clarify? Um, but adding facts may be problematic. And again, I think your city attorney can walk, we do whole trainings on quasi-judicial hearings, but I think um, your city attorney can walk you through what you're allowed to do and what you're not in that setting. And the idea is if you make a finding of fact, you're avoiding what's called arbitrary and capricious decisions. And so the litigation I see is over exactly that. That here's the record in front of the council, and they went completely against the record and the facts and made an arbitrary and capricious decision. They just arbitrarily decided something, but the facts that were presented to them uh, bore out something else. And just because it's alleged doesn't mean it's true, but that's often what comes out of it. So did, did that help answer the question? I, um, I'm an environmental scientist, and um, the answer is no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but if I, if I try to tell you about the actions of a fish breeding, I would probably confuse you too. Okay. <laughs> so, I get it. Um, but, okay, I'm sorry. Go on. Please continue with your, your presentation. 
Okay. And I think the best thing I would suggest is talking to Quinn, your city attorney, especially if you brought a project that you know has some complex environmental issues and you come with a, a set of understandings. I don't think you can question the findings of, of uh, the experts as presented. Um, but I would, I would really defer to Quinn on some of that because I don't conduct um, the hearings and I know Quinn's very good at uh, land use. Okay, well, thank you. I wasn't just talking about land use, but thank you. Please continue. I'm not trying to hold you up. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, the next area in land use that, that you can get somewhat into trouble is inserting yourself in a land use issue. So I'm going to give you three cases uh, by way of examples of what not to do. And the first one is actually one of our cases. Uh, it's Westmark versus the city of Burien. And it resulted in a $10 million verdict and a finding that the council interfered with the developer's business expectancy. So some of what happened in Westmark can't happen now. Um, this is before the current land use laws, which have deadlines for decision making. But this was a highly controversial project in the city of Burien, and it was right when they incorporated. In fact, this project had been started uh, with King County, and Burien actually incorporated back in 1993 on the idea that they really didn't want to be a community of apartments. They broke away from King County and incorporated because they really wanted to have more single family homes, and they didn't like uh, what was happening through the King County Land Use Department. So you went into this project, it was already with King County, they brought it in-house, they didn't have a lot of staff, and there were long delays in the project. Now, I'm gonna tell you this was a very sensitive environmental area, it was on a cliff. Um, there were significant environmental issues for which the developers wanted you know, to not have to do a lot of mitigation and a lot of study. And that was what we were looking at this lawsuit it was about was a, you know, a city saying you need to meet you know, certain regulations and Westmark saying, uh, well, can't you just give us a mitigated determination? We don't wanna go through a whole environmental impact study. And so there was this delay going back and forth. The problem was throughout this delay back and forth, which we said, hey, is on the developer, not us, was that the city council was saying things like, we really need to find a way to stop the project. We really don't want apartment buildings here. Um, and they were constantly dealing with staff turnover as a new city. And it was pretty clear that the planners knew the council was against this project. At one point, we did have a resolution. And the resolution was an approval of uh, a mitigated determination of significance and that we would pay $250,000 as WCIA. That went in front of the council in exec session, uh, and in exec session there, there was an, you know, a, an a, approval, not a vote, but basically we were told to move forward with negotiations. Uh, then when we put the deal together, uh, the city council would not approve it in open session and basically said no deal. So we were back um, in front of the court again, and in the end, um, the jury that heard this case did not believe that the delay was with uh, the developer. They felt that the delay was a direct result of the input of the council and of a state uh, legislator who lived in the neighborhood and didn't want the apartments. And so the, the jury uh, found the city liable for approximately $10 million in delay damages and attorney's fees. When we appealed this up to the Court of Appeals, they found a tortious interference and said, no, it's pretty apparent that the city council did not want these apartments, that they found ways to interfere throughout the uh, process and to intimidate staff. And when they had the ability to make it right and they had the ability uh, to resolve this, they chose uh, not to, and they chose to continue the delay. So again, um, this is where when you know a, a, a controversial project is going in, you want to make sure that you're not inserting yourself and you're letting your planning department do all of their work uh, independent uh, before they make the recommendations to you. So if you're interfering in the beginning, 
there's going to be an argument that you're causing any delays in that permitting process. The next one is Mission Springs versus the City of Spokane. And this is what I call the city attorney's case, and you'll see why when I describe it. Mission Springs was a huge development that was going in at the city. It was fairly controversial. It had met all of the requirements under their code, and it was proceeding as an approved development. And various citizens came to the mayor and said, you know, how do we stop this project? We don't want this project to go forward. And so the mayor said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you come to the next council meeting? He didn't advise the developer that they were going to talk about their development, and he had a packed room full of people. And what he did is he asked the planning director on the record, please let me know the status of the Mission Springs development. And the planning director said, we are about to issue, we're issuing the grading permits. The project is good to go. At that point, the mayor said, I am directing you to not issue the permits. And the city attorney, now what I'm guessing Quinn will do is he will say, I think we need to go into executive session. And in executive session, he's going to explain why you cannot do what you're doing, that it meets all of the development criteria, and the permit must issue. For whatever reason, the city attorney of Spokane decided on the record to say, Mr. Mayor, you do not have the authority to do that. It is illegal for the city not to issue the grading permit. And I urge you to stop this course of action. The mayor said, I don't care. The citizens are here. I am directing the public official not to issue the permit. So the permit didn't issue. The developer sued. And the court found, A, there was no legislative immunity because the mayor acted on their own. And they found that the mayor was liable under state and federal law. So not only was there no immunity, but there was clear liability because you were told that this is illegal, that this met every requirement of the city, and that the grading permit should issue. So not only no immunity and liability, it was deemed what's called an intentional act. And what that means is the city of Spokane had insurance, was insured through a private insurance carrier. And they said, look, you knowingly broke the law. Therefore, there is absolutely no coverage for any damages in this case. And there was litigation over that decision as well. I know there was a very large dollar settlement. I still don't know who paid it, if the carrier ended up paying it or if the city did. But I know it was a lot of money in the high six figures, but I don't know who paid it. So I say this because if your city attorney starts asking you to either go into executive session, I urge you to do that so that they can explain what your liability could be and the law. And additionally, listen to your city attorney. If they say this is not, you know, you cannot do this, this is illegal, you need to listen to them and listen to what they have to say. The next case is actually a win for Kitsap County, but it's illustrative, so that's why I use it. This was a group, a mobile home park development, and it had quite a bit of issues with the Department of Health regarding, I think, sanitary sewer septic systems. And so there was a long delay. And what normally happens is when there's a long delay, you often get a public records request in. So people can say, hey, what's really going on here? Why is this being delayed? We're being told it's because of the Department of Health. We think there's something else. And what happened was in this public record disclosure, there was an email from a commissioner to a constituent that said, don't worry, we will do everything we legally can to stop this project. And so Woodsview said, aha, it isn't the Department of Health that's the delay, it's the commissioners. They are trying to stop this project. So they're thinking they have the Westmark 
where, aha, people are to being told to delay. The good news for Kitsap County is that no one in their planning department knew anything about a commissioner wanting to stop this project. And so they were able to show that, look, we were never contacted by this commissioner. We had no idea that there was any opposition to this project. And in fact, um, this all of this delay was for uh, the Department of Health to evaluate it. And so what the decision said is avoiding the taint of bad faith is paramount in land use. And so they found there was no bad faith um, by anyone that was working on the project because they had no idea what the commissioner said. So what I would caution is because of that email is why Kitsap County was in litigation. Uh, you know, had that email not been put out or had people not heard that a commissioner was against the project, you, you wouldn't have had a lawsuit. And so just that idea that there could be interference uh, generated a lawsuit uh, that the county had to defend. So with land use, any questions I can answer? Okay, don't see any. So let's get into the world of personnel. Uh, what I will say with personnel law is you want to stay as a council in your legislative role. And your role in personnel is to set policies, set budgets, and municipal codes. You don't want to stray into the executive role, which is the mayor and Larry. Um, they are responsible for the management of employees, the hiring and firing of employees, and the discipline of employees. And as you know, that person, that executive, they can be held personally liable for employment actions. I am, you know, can be held personally liable for the actions that I take. And so you don't want to involve yourself um, because this is an area where personnel law is changing constantly. And it's a very complex area and there's a lot of minefields throughout it. And in fact, we have a program uh, where we offer to our members a, a consult with a attorney on any employment issue they may have and they can talk to that attorney and work through that issue so that they don't violate the law. What I have seen is when you have uh, members of the council getting involved in personnel actions, it can lead to a lot of bad feelings. It can add to uh, quite a bit of discussion and I've had it where cities have basically uh, kind of gotten into war over a personnel action that has gone on and it's really distracted the city from day-to-day -day business. So Lauren, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just have a question on that front with respect to um, remaining in that legislative role. Um, when you have staff or employees that are kind of blocking your ability to legislate and wanting to um, kind of act as a legislator in the drafting and um, creation of ordinances, and you let folks know about that, I mean, it, it, it's kind of a gray area a little bit to me because you're, you're trying to legislate and fulfill your obligations and duties as a counselor, but on the other hand, staff's trying to block that. Um, but when you raise the issue that, that's going on, um, is that getting into the arena of managing staff? Um, I think if you have somebody presenting you with, let's say, a policy, it may be because the policy is set legally. Um, we have quite a few, like a harassment policy, um, that is you know, already vetted through a lawyer. And so you want to make sure, I mean, there's requirements in certain policies. Uh, personnel policies, there are certain requirements that you need to have. So it may be something like that. I don't know for sure um, that that is, but generally um, what I see staff presenting is usually something that they've vetted maybe through a, a law firm. Um, not sure if that's what you're talking about. Yeah, I guess um, maybe it'd be good just to have the contact information for additional uh, follow-up for legal counsel that's available. Well, I would, I would actually say um, follow up with your city attorney because they're probably the ones that are starting the draft. I'm not sure, Larry, does Quinn work on your, your policies? Yes, he does. He does work okay. on our policies. Okay. 
Because it might be worth talking to your city attorney on that one too, as to um, what you know why they're drafting it the way they are. It's hard for me to speak um, to not knowing specifics and what you know the reason why they're saying you, you know this this policy needs to go forward this way. Uh, I look. It looks like Kevin, you have a question. Uh, yes, I do. Um, this one's kind of. It's an issue that's popped up, you know, lately. When you receive information from a city employee supervisor um, about possible harassment, mm. um, but he asks for your confidentiality. <laughs> And yeah. now you're kind of stuck between informing the executive and living up to what he's requested. Right. Uh, any advice on that one? Absolutely. And you're actually getting into my next slide. Um, the advice is that you cannot have confidentiality. So um, your you as council members are held to the harassment and discrimination policies. And you, if let's, I'm gonna get to your question, but I wanna do a little bit of background. Um, okay. Harassment and discrimination, um, those policies, you adhere to them, and so you should know the law, and you should know your individual policies as the city. If you are aware of behavior or made aware of a problem, it must be reported to the executive, and that's because harassment law, harassment and discrimination says that once you have been made aware of it, and you are the city, you are in a legislative role, you're also um, considered to be, you know, supervisors, managers, um, people that are of a certain level are held to be the city. So once the city has knowledge, they must investigate. And so my advice, and I've had this happen to me personally, where someone has come to me and said, uh, I, you know, this, my uh, manager is intimidating me, is harassing me uh, because I'm a woman. And, but I don't want you to do anything about it. I just want to put you on notice. The answer is, I'm sorry. I have to report this. I cannot keep it confidential. Um, it, you know, the law requires me to do so. And so that's when you need to report it immediately to Larry, the mayor, and then we, uh, you know, we will help them with an investigation if one is needed. So, um, you know, th there's a lot of difference between illegal harassment discrimination and what the words harassment and discrimination. And so uh, that's why I would encourage you to go to the training because um, there are, you know, there are forms of discrimination that are legal. Uh, there are forms of harassment that are, quote, legal. It's what's illegal under the law. And usually it's based on certain factors like gender, national origin, race, religion. So, you know, my boss may be mean to me and I may say he's harassing me, but that may not be illegal harassment. But I don't expect you um, to have that conversation with the employee, but that's why the uh, executives need to know so that they can investigate and determine if there is any illegal um, harassment discrimination going on under the policies. And okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, Lauren, I see you have a question. So, and it's an interesting conversation about what's harassment and what's not, but um, just in general, it sounds like asking for work products, even maybe if it's a little bit too frequent product, uh, too frequent occurrence is not harassment per se. Um, maybe not, but I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. Um, let's say there's myself and my male coworker, and the boss tells the male coworker, you're doing, you know, you're doing a great job, and I know he's behind on assignments, but I keep getting told I have to do my job, I have to do my job, I'm behind, I'm behind, I'm behind. I may make, be able to make some type of claim that it's based on my gender. I'm not saying I'm going to get there, but sometimes it can be as, as little as there's what's called a desperate treatment where, you know, they're a little easier on the guys, a little more demanding on you know, the female. That may get there, um, may not, just really depends on the totality of the circumstances and the evidence. 
Um, you can also have situations that policies, um, by their very nature, can be discriminatory. And that's where um, you know, we also help with uh, some of the policies to make sure they don't have um, any, uh, what I would say, uh, any language or any action that may um, result in some type of discrimination complaint. But just like now, when you apply for a job, there's not a lot on there anymore. Like when I applied for jobs, there was all kinds of private information that was asked for. And now, um, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's pretty strict on what you can get on an application and what you can ask during an interview. So, um, you know, I remember being asked, you know, what are your plans for having a family? Do you think you'll be pregnant in the next couple of years? Well, you can't ask those kind of questions anymore. Um, so it's things like that, um, that that can get you into trouble. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So I'm going to talk about another area, um, and this one's kind of confusing, and so I'll, I'll go through this with some example, and then you know we can talk about it. It's something called negligent misrepresentation. So as I mentioned earlier, you're kind of you're, you're held as a speaking agent, a representative of the city, and what can happen is if you make a representation to an individual. And they rely on that, and I, I say here, a specific promise or assurance. So if you make a promise or an assurance, and this doesn't, don't, don't think about campaigns. Um, this, does, this is more as a, a city council person. If you say you make a promise or assurance, I rely on that, and I'm damaged because of it, I could have a claim for negligent misrepresentation. So let me give you a specific example. Uh, one of our members uh, has a downtown that is all cedar shingle, and every downtown building has to be clad in cedar shingle. And a business owner uh, who actually owned the building came in and talked to the mayor and said, you know, this is ridiculous. It's too expensive. Um, I've got to replace the, the shingle, but I can't afford to put new cedar on. Is there any way... Um, that I can do something different. And the mayor said, well, I really value you as a business. I value um, making sure that you stay in the community. So I'm going to go ahead and say, you can just go put up stucco. That's fine. Um, and so the business owner tore down his shingles, put up stucco, and next thing he knew, he had a stop work order from the building official saying, you're violating code, and you must take down all this stucco. And he said, but I talked to the mayor. And the mayor told me I could do it. And the mayor um, did say, yeah, I did tell him that. I did tell him that he could do it. I wanted to keep him um, in the community. Well, that went directly against code. And therefore, um, that was a promise that could not be kept. And therefore, there were damages, which were the cost of the shingles, as well as the, re I mean, the cost of the stucco, as well as the removal of the stucco. And so we paid that claim because there was a specific promise that that person relied upon to their detriment. Kevin, it looks like you have a question. Yeah, it's directly related, and this is uh, something that came up, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody on the room or on the phone. So if we issue a building permit that has diagrams of exactly what they're doing and we don't know what's under the land and we issue them after we they they pay the fees for this the building inspector says yes you can do it whose fault is it when we find out there's hazardous waste underground that um, that that's actually something totally different than this um building officials have immunity and there's also something called the public duty doctrine which says when a building official is acting ministerially, um, they're not liable. Um, so if you have even an inspector goes out, all you're looking for is does it meet the code? So any um, condition or problems with construction, um, they're not there to ensure the quality of the work or that um, there's not a problem. They're just making sure it fits code. And so there's a whole line of cases along that line 
that deal with the immunity for public officials and this thing called um, the public duty doctrine that says when you're in your ministerial role, um, you don't have liability. So that's a little bit different scenario than <laughs> making the promise and assurance to someone. So, um, but if, if for example, um, there was a known hazard so if the building official goes out and there is a known dangerous hazard, they know about it and they look the other way, that's a problem. But they don't have a duty to investigate further. And they have to know it's a hazardous condition for that public duty doctrine to not apply. What if, uh, and I know I'm dragging it on, Mayor, I do apologize, but you know why I'm asking the question. Uh, what if we had an easement on a property and we lost the records and nobody knew about it and we tried to blame the homeowner. You have an easement? If, I mean, an easement is legally recorded, so it's got to be somewhere, right? Uh, yeah, you'd think it wasn't. Okay. I mean, I don't think it really falls under the negligent misrepresentation and and there's a whole other group of law that talks about, um, you know, this is just an easement, but with public property, you can't have um, prescriptive uh, easements or, um, God, there's another term for it. Sorry, it's, uh, you basically, you, you know, someone can't take over public property and call it theirs just because you stopped using it. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm just blanking it. It must be the hour. But uh, there's a whole bunch of law, because people were doing that in Seattle with some of the waterfront property where they said, well, the city didn't even know they owned it and the city isn't using it. Well, it's still public land. And so just because you know it, it's, the city maybe forgot about it, it doesn't become yours. Um, adverse possession, thank you, that's the term. So you can't adversely possess what is public land. So. Um, you know, I, easements I'm not positive on, but generally, um, if it's public, you can't say you own it now. Does even that make sense? When, even when you ask the city for a building permit on top of an easement that they don't know where the easement is? Uh, that's such a specific question. I'm going to refer to your city attorney because I'm not, I, I wouldn't, I have to know all the facts of it. And so if the city, you know, generally if a city has property, you can't, um, you know, the city has to make a decision to vacate that, you know, property or that easement before you can do anything is usually my understanding. But I'm going to defer that one to the city attorney because I'm not positive. I yeah, some, something tells me we'll be talking about this for two hours if I don't shut up. So I do apologize. <laughs> No problem. So um, what I would say with uh, negligent misrepresentation is if you don't have the answer, feel free to say, I don't know, um, but I know a staff person that can answer the question. And that's usually your safest route is you have specialists on city staff. And so if you get a specific question, you can say, I don't have the answer to your constituent, but uh, I know who, who does. And feel free to uh, say, you know, here's the person I'm going to refer you to and uh, let me know uh, if, if, if they don't contact you or if you don't get an answer from them. What I would say is, you know, you don't want to take matters into your own hands. Um, we actually have had situations where we've paid claims because, you know, a, a public official has said, you know, don't worry, we'll take care of it. I'll um, handle all of it for you, and then it just becomes, um, you know, something it shouldn't have been, and the person was damaged from it. So uh, I again would say, um, you know, just refer it to staff. That's what they're there for, and that's what they're experts in. Kevin, I, I see your hand up. Is that from the last question, or did you have another question for me? Sorry, I had to unmute. I, I do apologize. I'm, I'm not trying to ask that many questions, uh, lower hand, sorry. Okay. All right, so the next area where councils can get in trouble is what's called defamation. So I'm gonna start this out by saying you in elections, when you are running for office, you can defame your opponent all you want. There's actual case law on that. 
So uh, anything you say about your opponent, you can't be sued for. Uh, so this does not apply to elections. So in general, when you are legislating, you're But where you can get into trouble, and this is where I would say um, be cautious when you're talking about an individual. Um, you are in a public forum, and so part of defamation is um, that this has been made open to the public. I mean, if I'm talking to my friend and I defame somebody, um, it may not be legally defamation because it wasn't, quote, published where the public would see it. In a council meeting, you're definitely in an open forum. So um, any untruth, any untruth um, can give rise to liability. And that's where you have to be careful because uh, unless you know for a fact, and let's just say, um, you know, I, you may say, I'm pretty sure Anne isn't a real blonde. Uh, and I think she's, you know, faking it as a blonde. Well, guess what? Uh, I'm a blonde. That untruth could um, give rise to liability. Now, there are some areas um, with public officials where there is some leeway, uh, but if it's staff or a private individual, I wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't defame, uh, look at defaming anybody or making any statements about an individual. And like I said, it's a fine line on a public official. Um, you know, if, if you're going to talk about them or make disparaging comments. Uh, there are situations where I've seen even after uh, employees leave a position at the city um, that there are things said about them. I've seen uh, defamation lawsuits brought uh, against councils who have talked about people who've left or, uh, and, and made disparaging comments in public. That's that's really where this comes from, is an untruth, a knowing untruth that um, is, you know, is, is published, is what they call it, published. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's in the paper. Lauren. I'm curious to know about the flip side of that for council members um, possibly being defamed by staff and the risk of trying to clear the public record um, as a council member that um, maybe has been defamed by staff, wants to clear the public record, but then doesn't want to be at risk of defamation? Uh, I would say um, it, how it, it depends on how the city staff is addressing it. Again, it has to be an untruth, and it has to be published, which means public, and it has to be a knowing untruth. So I would suggest that that not be brought up in an open session, and I suggest you talk to the mayor or Larry about that privately. And I think that's where um, you don't have that publication. So if you have a concern, um, I would definitely bring it to your executives to say, I have a concern about what's being stated, uh, and look for avenues to address it there rather than in the public. Yeah. Lauren. And what resources are available to council members who may have been um, may have faced this defamation through uh, Washington cities? Um, we would not. We defend the city. So if you have a defamation claim, we would be defending the city. So we don't help. Um, I wouldn't help you perfect a defamation claim because it would be against the city. No, I'm sorry. I guess. Um, yeah, in that, I guess in that scenario, if someone would make a claim against an individual council member, would would there be resources available to a council member? Oh, sure. If you if you defame someone, <laughs> and you're within within the course and scope of your duties, I would provide you a defense. Now, there was a situation where a council member, um, on their own time, not during a council meeting, not you know part of their duties decided to email um, a, an employer of a previous employee, a current employer. So employee quits, goes to another employer, and the council member sent uh, an email to the new employer saying, you can't trust this person, they're a liar. When they were at the city, they did X, Y, and Z. 
And that was decided that that wasn't within the course and scope of your duties as a council member. And so that was individual. They had to defend that themselves because it really wasn't part of their job duties to contact a new employer regarding an ex-employee. But if you have a situation where you make a comment and you were on the dais, then you are insured through WCIA when you are within the course and scope of your duties as a council member. Thank you, Matt. How does that work with conflict of interest? Let's say a city councilman employs a contractor through the city, but then that contractor turns around and the city councilman now works for him. What type of conflict of interest would that cause? That one I'm going to defer to your city attorney on and your conflict of interest policy. And there's some pretty good resources through AWC and MRSC where you could ask what's the conflict of interest. There's state law that deals with conflict of interest, and there's some pretty specific statutes on that, so I wouldn't start to quote that. But often you have that in your own policies. I would think you have. We have a resolution in our organization that regards me and conflict of interest, and it kind of outlines what I can and can't do. So I would defer to if you think there's a conflict, talk to your city attorney. And again, MRSC is Municipal Research Services, and they have quite a bit of information on their website. We work quite closely with them, and they could probably help you with the conflict question, as well as your city attorney. Thank you. So the next area that we could have liability is in public works. And this is an area that I see a lot of exposure from councils, and I've seen it in claims throughout the years. So one thing I'm going to tell you about is something called joint and several liability, and this exists in the state of Washington. Joint and several liability basically says if a plaintiff is fault-free and there are multiple defendants, if there is at least 1% of fault attributed to a defendant, that plaintiff can collect the entire judgment from that defendant. So normally you would think if you're sitting on a jury and you say Ann's 70% at fault and the other driver is 30% at fault, you would think that I would pay 70% of the damages, and the other driver would pay 30%. When the plaintiff is fault-free, they can collect the entire amount from me or the entire amount from the other person. When juries are making these decisions, they don't know about joint and several liability. They're not allowed to. So what often occurs is that cities get dragged in to basic lawsuits because there's not enough insurance to cover the injuries of the party who is damaged. This comes up a lot with crosswalks, with signs, with speed limits. It's called basically negligent road design. And so what happens is someone is walking in a crosswalk. They're hit by a car. They have catastrophic injuries, and maybe that car only has $25,000 worth of insurance. They're going to look for another what we call deep pocket, which is normally the city. And they're going to sue the city and say the design of the crosswalk was negligent, the lighting was negligent, the speed limit was too high, there wasn't enough signage. And what these cases become are engineering malpractice cases. And so what we have to do is usually the other side retains an expert who says, here's the engineering protocol that should have been used, and the city didn't do it. And what we do is we put on our city traffic engineers and say, here's the engineering that we used. And there's things called the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices that guide it. There's 
warrants that guide specific treatments, stop signs, speed limits, and all of that study comes into play. And that's how we defend those cases. But what can happen is that sometimes you have pressures from citizens to say, we want a crosswalk here. And so you, you know, want them to feel safe. And you think, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's put a crosswalk in there. Well, believe it or not, more people are killed in crosswalks than they are jaywalking. And that's because they have a false sense of security. And the last thing you want to do is put in a crosswalk that has not met the warrants for a crosswalk. There's all kinds of conflict that occurs with a crosswalk. You can have, um, one, you know, you're coming out of a blind corner and there's a crosswalk, or it puts people, uh, mid-block crosswalks can often be problematic um, because there's no uh, stop sign or way to uh, alert people that there's a crosswalk there. So what we say is um, if you have an inquiry from your citizens that say they want a particular traffic control device or speed limit, that you give it to your traffic engineers to determine what's appropriate. So uh, you want to avoid promises, assurances, and inflammatory statements. And sometimes this will come up. You have a horrible accident, and it's devastating to a community. Um, if you start coming out immediately and saying there was a problem, then we have to go on the defensive and say, what are your engineering credentials? How much have you studied um, you know, the traffic patterns? I've had situations where council members have said, you know, there's too many accidents out there, people are driving too fast, uh, and that's why this happened. And the answer was that no, this happened because the driver had their son in their eyes and the four-year-old just ran out in front of her car. But because of the statements made by, uh, the inflammatory statements made after the fact, we ended up being in litigation and the council members were actually called at trial um, to testify and they had to say, well, I just said those things. There was no, it was just my opinion and I didn't have any data to back it up. And you really don't want to be in that position. So I would say to you, this is an area that you have staff for, that you want to listen to your staff and you don't want to get into um, creating conflict because sometimes by putting certain signs in and stop signs in that aren't done appropriately, you create a lot of conflict further down, further back. So uh, again, I don't know if this comes up in your community. It comes up in a lot of communities, and these are very expensive cases. Um, they're generally not brought for you know small injuries. These are often fatalities, quad, uh, quadriplegia cases, and, and brain injury cases. So. We're talking, you know, millions of dollars that can be at stake, and it's very hard for us to defend these um, when there's not um, pure engineering behind it. Any questions on this one? Um, I would ask that when you have an executive session that you do not leave that session. <laughs> um, I am. Uh, I always say that they exist for a reason. And the reason is so that you can have a candid discussion of your legal defenses. Um, when I'm talking executive session, you have it in real estate deals, you have it in litigation, matters of litigation. And the reason that you're having it in executive session is because it would prejudice you if that information is released to the public. So for by way of example, many years ago, I had a lawsuit and I was asked to come to the council in exec session and explain what I thought the weaknesses were and why I was resolving it. And I they asked specific questions about, you know, the strength of my argument and they asked for specific dollar amounts of what I thought that would be um, settled for. Unfortunately, when I got to the mediation, my entire conversation was um, known by everyone in the other room. And that's because uh, a council member t disclosed all of that to the other side. So, you know, one, I would say, you know, disclose any conflicts you have. If you have a conflict and the plaintiff is a good friend and you don't feel that you can keep this information to yourself, then just recuse yourself. Uh, you also can jeopardize our defense and you can have possible sanctions. Uh, and I had a situation where uh, we sent in a lawyer to talk about a very uh, controversial 
land use issue and talked about all of the defenses and the possible legal ramifications. And that all went to a special interest group that was opposed to the development. And it severely hampered our ability. So again, if I find out that we, anything that we give you in exec session is leaked, and I've had this happen, we just stopped giving updates to the city and we just handled it ourselves and didn't release information because we didn't think it could be kept confidential. Any questions on that? And this is Mylon Wally, council member. During a meeting, council meeting, if a council member would like to have an executive session, could he, he or she could ask for that? Or do you have to have a publicized and a week in advance that the city's going to have a executive session? I believe you can, at a meeting, go into exec session, but you have to have it only for specific reasons. There's only specific things you can go into executive session for. And that's when, you know, if it's regarding litigation, you have to have an attorney present to go into exec session for that. If you're going to exec session to discuss negotiations on a lease or real estate deal, I don't think you have to have an attorney present. If it's to discuss personnel matters, you have to say why you're going into executive session, the specific reason before you go in. But I don't think that has to be publicized ahead of time. And again, I think I would defer to your city attorney a little bit on that, but I believe you can go into executive session as long as you say, I'm requesting an executive session under this specific reason, under RCW, blah, 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 you quote the right RCW. And then I believe that's when you can go. But again, I would defer to your city attorney on that. Yeah, okay, thank you. I would also caution you to be mindful of your written communications. Email, Twitter, Facebook, all of your city email is public record. So what I would say is you want to use your city email and not your personal email. If a public records request comes in and you're using your personal email, you're going to need to search your entire personal email account for any that relate to city business and are part of that public records request. If you're using a personal computer, it could subject it to search. Oftentimes what you're doing is you're going to be doing a declaration that says, I have searched my computer and this is what I found that relates to the city business. So again, there was some cases that came out where there was city business done on a private computer, a public records request came in, and none of that was disclosed. And so oftentimes city staff is going to come to you and say, we have a public records request, I need you to search your computer, and you're going to sign a declaration that you did the search and this is what you found. So I see two hands on that one, so we'll start with Kevin. Yeah, not a question, I'm just making the comment. We've had this discussion in the last couple of weeks. We don't have, there's a few of us that do not have access to city emails. And as far as city computers, flat out, the city cannot afford to buy us all the computers, so we have to use our own. Luckily, I spill things on my laptop enough that they can't search it. They get thrown away. But I'm just making the comment, we do need to have the city emails addresses for the city council members. Lauren, your turn. Yeah, I'm just curious how that extends to your personal phone. I'm on my personal phone this evening. And whether or not someone were to make a lawsuit against me for whatever the case may be, whether that personal phone could then be searched. Because at the point where I'm risking all my family photos and that sort of personal family communication, I won't use my personal devices for city business and then the city's responsibility is to provide some way to communicate. So I'm just kind of curious where that sits. Yeah, it's going to be you searching for 
the public document on your phone most of the time. But it may, a judge may say, I'm, I don't trust that you found everything. Um, regarding a cell phone, there's a case um, involving uh, Pierce County, it's Nissen versus Pierce County, where uh, the uh, city prosecutor, uh, or uh, county prosecutor, sorry, um, was using his personal uh, account, personal phone, and sending out text messages regarding um, a, a matter of public concern. And so that was his argument, is it's my personal cell phone, these are personal text messages, and they said no, because you're talking about the business of the county on that personal phone. So he had a duty to disclose those text messages that dealt with county business. They also requested his cell phone bill, and they uh, found that he was, the argument that he made was, my bill is my business, and you don't get my, my bill and my phone calls. And the answer was, when you use it for city business, you have to disclose those numbers um, and the parts of the bill that dealt with um, city business, or, or that one was county business. So there is some, but it really relates to the business, the, the public portion um, only, not your private photos. That wouldn't be disclosable. So most of the time, um, you know, it, parts of it could be, but it would only relate to the city business use of your cell phone. So that's where I would I would be careful with the text messages, um, or because you need to be able to keep a record of those if they're public, um, if they're they're dealing with public uh, information. I mean, something that says I'm on my way to the council meeting, that's not going to get you there. But if you're discussing city business on a text, you want to make sure you can pull that text message. Sure, yeah, I know, I appreciate that. As long as the family stuff is um, private. Yeah, and even on, I mean, I, I always, I tell my employees, you know, public, assume everything you do on your public email is public. Um, but there are even, even when you're on a city email, there are some things that they say, no, you don't have to disclose, it's too private in nature. Um, but again, I always, I, I assume everything's public and I don't do any private business on my, my city or my public email. Okay, thank you, Anne. Uh-huh. Any other questions on this one? Um, so I would also say be very mindful of the Open Public Meetings Act. You don't want to build consensus on email. Um, you don't want to have any type of uh, pre-voting or looking like you're making decisions in a serial meeting um, on email. You have to be very careful with that. Um, this is also an area where, um, under the Open Public Meetings Act, you may lose your legislative immunity. Um, so again, um, these are just cautions. I know your city attorneys are really good about um, training you on this stuff. One thing I want to bring up is a really new issue that just came in for us. Um, and it dealt with a mayor's Facebook page. And what, and this is kind of this gray area, because the mayor had a personal Facebook page but was doing quite a bit of um, promotion and forum, kind of opened a forum for citizens to contact him on his personal page. So some cities, you know, the mayor will have a city Facebook page. Um, this, this wasn't the case where um, this was a personal Facebook page. And what occurred was that a, a member of a group, um, a, a, basically a hate group, um, started messaging on this private Facebook page, and the mayor blocked them. And the mayor blocked the content, and this person filed a claim saying, the mayor opened a public forum, and when you open a public forum, you ha I have First Amendment rights to speech, and therefore you cannot block me. Now, most cities don't have that ability for people to comment back and forth. They have a push out of information because they don't want to open up that public forum. Because once you open it, you can't block someone's rights on you know, speech during a public forum. So most, you don't have to have that back and forth. But that was the big question where the mayor said, this was my personal page, but it was squishy enough that there, our attorney said there is a potential First Amendment claim there, and we paid a very small amount of money uh, uh, to settle it, but we still felt there was exposure. So, so just be aware of that. Um, it's no 
steadfast law, but you have to be real careful um, when you open up uh, forums. So, any questions on that one? Uh, yeah. Um, so we actually had this while we were, I was doing the census. Um, was the on the other side of town for me? We had a gentleman that uh, put in his wet window "Black Lives Matter" sign. Um, I think his kids did it. They did it kind of rainbow colors. And across the street and two doors down, somebody put a sign and says, "Black Lives Matter doesn't." Uh, black lives don't matter to me. Um, and this was probably a month or two before I became part of city council. Now, when you're talking about free speech, how does a city deal with that? Because it is potentially explosive. It's a, potentially a deadly situation. Um, I, I would have gotten angry if one of my children would have been living in that house. So I, I just thought I'd ask that question. Well, what you're looking at, you know, the, the people have, it, it depends on, and again, there's all kinds of case law on First Amendment, but, um, you know, basically my context is, you know, when a city violates, I mean, the government has to stop your speech. So, First Amendment triggers when the government interferes in your speech. So having, you know, the idea that the city would tell someone you have to take down this sign because of content um, is troublesome. And I say that because, you know, you, there, there are areas where you can, and like I said, there's a whole body of law that you can tell people um, you know, to that you can't have hate, certain hate speech or uh, things that can incite. But I'll be honest, I mean, we've had cities that didn't want the Nazi party in their parade, and the answer was, you opened it up, you have to have the Nazi party in your parade because of the First Amendment. So, um, you know, it's, it's government stopping speech by content is what violates the First Amendment. So that's where, um, you know, people use the First Amendment a lot, but it's really based on the government stopping speech because of content. And there, there are exceptions, but they're narrow. So does that help? It does. disconcerting, but it does help. Yeah, it's, um, again, that, that's where we say that the public forum part of it is what where you, you have to be careful. So if... Let's say you opened up City Hall and said, everybody, you know, come in and put your viewpoint on a, bowl, a board. If you as a city open that, what's called public forum, you can't control that speech. Now, if you said, um, you know, we're going to allow for, you know, specific um, statements or, you know, you haven't opened up a public forum, you're probably okay, but the public forum aspect is where you're going to get yourself in trouble. Once you open it up, you can't control content. So that's a, a very small uh, part of all the big law that is the First Amendment. <laughs> well, I, I kind of want to follow up on that. Don't we have laws that talk about um, hate, um, mm -hmm. hate crimes? And mm -hmm. can't we can't we say, look? This is hate. You know, you, you don't you don't get to do that in our town. Um, some sometimes, and it's narrow, and that's where I will say, you know, there are exceptions to where you can take action on hate crimes, etc. Um, you know, violation of criminal statutes, but um, you know, leg legislating content or shutting down the government stepping in can be problematic. But again, there's there's tons of case law on this stuff, um, and you know there are ways that you can have hate crimes um, prosecuted, and it's it's just the idea of um, cities regulating speech that can get you into into some trouble. But again, there's a whole area of law, and uh, you know we would if you had a question on something like that, um, we would definitely be able to give some legal consultation on 
that. And we've had it with various, um, you know, we opened up a, we have our uh, parade and, you know, we don't want these participants because of X, Y, Z, and we'll walk you through that. Because there's, there's a lot of law on that topic. Thank you. I'm so, I, I know I'm annoying tonight, but I'm always annoying. You just don't I like me. questions. <laughs> You've I challenged know. me tonight. You're making me scratch my head, and I'm deferring to your city attorney a lot, which tells me you have really good questions. All right. Thank you. Uh-huh. Lauren. I just want to um, I appreciate Kevin's questions and comments, and uh, he's not annoying any of us. I don't think it's a good conversation. Yeah, I like it. And like I said, I like when I get challenged with some of these questions. And, and again, I live in a very gray area, um, and there's some black and white, but a lot of it is case law driven and, you know, up for argument. And that's, you know, that's why you have the attorneys that you have is because, you know, it is all up for um, debate and argument. So that is the end of my presentation. Are there any other questions I can answer? No, I would like to thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Ann, for a very, very lively, good discussion. Uh, I think we'll have learned quite a bit, particularly to be very careful in what we do. Thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> or don't do. I appreciate that. Thank you so much uh, for having me. And uh, again, we really appreciate having Goldendale as a member and uh, since 1986. So, uh, again, thank you so much for, for being a member of WCIA. Well, thank you, Ann. Thank you. When we're allowed, come see us. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Larry? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was okay. just going to address Larry. Okay. Um, I'm going to sign off if that's okay, everybody. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, Larry, can you get me the um, somebody from the Chamber of Commerce? Nobody's called me back yet. Yes, I can. I will call the president of the Chamber and ask her to give you a call. Thank you so much. I, I don't mean to be a pain, but you know I always am. Okay. Thank you. All right, bye. Uh, Kevin, this is uh, Mylon. Uh, you probably know that there's been a change now in the uh, chamber. Uh, there, there's a new uh, uh, president, and so they're working on getting things organized. And then very seldom there's anybody there. So that's probably why you didn't get any uh, answer back. Well, well, thank you, Mylon. I'm just, I'm just trying to help out the city while I'm down here in Palm Springs. It's, it's a long story. Larry knows the story. Um, <laughs> it's yeah. It's okay, but I'm sure Larry will help me out. Very good. Any other questions or comments from the council before we close this work session? If not, we'll close the city council for this evening and uh, we'll see you later in the week with other activities. Thank you all. <laughs>